Welcome back to the channel. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you're watching Lawyer Up. I want to thank everybody that has liked, that has subscribed, that has commented. Uh, we are getting a lot of comments about how good the editing is. And that's not me. That's uh, Grayson Roberts with Boss Industries. So here's a shout out to him. Thanks for all the production work you're doing and doing a great job. Now you may have heard we are doing a $50 Amazon giveaway. And we are. All you have to do is to comment the word giveaway on any of my videos and you'll be entered to win. We'll draw in about two weeks and one of you lucky viewers will get a $50 Amazon gift card. Now in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about methamphetamine. Now why methamphetamine you may ask? Well, because over half of the people that are in jail or prison I should say, in over half of the states are there because of methamphetamine. And it's a topic that deserves discussion. We're in the middle of a pandemic with coronavirus, but we have an epidemic in this country and it's called methamphetamine. If you learned something today, hit that like button. If you wanna learn more, subscribe. If you think you have some friends that might enjoy this channel, share me on social media. And if you got something to say to me, comment below. And remember, I am a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. If you need advice specific to your legal situation, you need to lawyer up with an attorney in your area. So let's talk about the history of methamphetamine in the United States. As I've already told you, already half of the people in over half of the states are there for methamphetamine, and that's use and or distribution. I've been practicing law for over 20 years uh, on the criminal defense side, and I have represented people um, from the lowest levels where they just got caught with a small amount of uh, methamphetamine uh, in their pocket. All the way to drug kingpins at the federal level that were trafficking over a hundred thousand kilos of methamphetamine. And if you know the uh, translation uh, rate to that, that's over 220,000 pounds of methamphetamine that they were trafficking. If you get caught with one pound of methamphetamine, you're in a lot of trouble. So you can only imagine what getting caught with over 220,000 pounds of distribution activity will land you. You basically go to prison forever. In these cases, uh, at the lower level, when you're dealing with the users of methamphetamine, when you're dealing with basically what we call street level vendors, uh, the people that are basically selling it just to support their habit, we try to get these people into drug court. Obviously, any amount of methamphetamine is a felony. So if it's a first offense or even a second offense, what we try to do is rehabilitate the individual through drug court, uh, break the habit, and hopefully keep the felony off of their record. Now, if you are participating in the distribution of methamphetamine at any significant level, uh, you are likely to be indicted in federal court. And once you get to federal court, uh, it is a class A felony to distribute methamphetamine. The sentencing range is from 10 years, and that's the minimum, to life. So if you get caught distributing methamphetamine at any significant level, uh, it's not an issue usually about probation or not probation. It's usually about how many decades you're gonna spend behind bars. Now the history of the synthesis and the distribution of methamphetamine in the United States is quite fascinating. And theoretically, the tug of war over the years between the legislature, the law enforcement, when you're talking DEA agents, FBI agents, uh, local law enforcement on drug task force, and the ingenuity of criminal defendants, that back and forth between them over the years is really interesting. However, as a practical matter, we have to acknowledge the fact and remember the fact that methamphetamine ruins lives. It ruins families and it ruins communities. In communities where we have a higher instance of methamphetamine cases and arrests, we see a higher instance of domestic violence. We see more kids being taken into protective services and we see more hospitalizations. So we in no way want to glamorize methamphetamine use and we want to remember that it destroys lives. That being said, let's talk about the history of methamphetamine in the United States. 
Now, amphetamines have been around since the turn of the century and were first created in 1899. The U.S. government even used amphetamines during World War II. They were given to soldiers to help them stay alert during the war. Now, amphetamine is simply a stimulant. We find that in prescription medication, Adderall, for example, uh, that is given to people who suffer from narcolepsy and adult ADHD have a uh, amphetamine in the prescription medication. So when I talk about amphetamine, we're talking about, uh, we'll call him a junior high kid that gets pretty good grades. Now, when we're talking about methamphetamine, we're talking about his older brother who smokes and drinks, don't go to school, and has been to juvie. We're talking bad news. So after World War II, amphetamine and methamphetamine kind of took a hiatus until the 60s when a group of uh, biker gangs in California started producing methamphetamine out of swimming pool cleaner. Yeah, no kidding, that's what they used. It's called phenylacetone, and it's referred to as P2P in the literature. Now that's not PCP, that's something totally different. But your phenylacetone is P2P. Now remember that, P2P, because at the end of this, it comes full circle. So biker gangs are creating methamphetamine with phenylacetone, right? And by the 1970s, the government caught on. Hey, this is bad news. We should make methamphetamine illegal. And so that's what they did in 1970. Now, how do you think the bikers responded? Well, you're right, they didn't care. They continued to peddle methamphetamine all over, at that point in time, was in California and in the West. And this drug continued to gain popularity as it moved East until about 1980, when the government decided, well, just declaring meth illegal is not gonna get it done. So they finally went after the precursor. They went after the phenylacetone and they required anybody wanting to get that particular precursor to have a legitimate reason. You had to have a license to get it. In fact, you had to be, say, operating a swimming pool company to have the need to get swimming pool cleaner or your phenylacetone. So in 1980, when the government realized that we need to go to the source of how they're creating this and make that much more difficult to get, that really did put a dent in the methamphetamine business. However, criminals are fairly ingenious and they just kind of changed courses. And when they did so, methamphetamine exploded. It was in the early 80s where criminals quit using P2P and they started using ephedrine. Now, ephedrine as a precursor creates methamphetamine with about twice the kick, some really nasty stuff. But in the 80s, ephedrine was very easy to get your hands on. It was not regulated and you could get it in mass quantities in powder form. In fact, Jesus and Luis Amezqua through the Colima cartel in Mexico became famous worldwide because they basically dominated the ephedrine market in the United States and in Mexico. And then even after it was outlawed in the United States or at least put under regulation, the Amezqua brothers simply shifted their source of supply to India and they were literally filling planes full of ephedrine and flying it to Mexico so that they could make meth. That was in the late 80s and the early 90s. Now, they got busted and they're in prison now, and the government caught on and they started regulating ephedrine. In fact, it became regulated worldwide eventually. And again, the legislation put a big dent in the methamphetamine market. However, criminals, not to be deterred, just changed their precursor again. And it was in the 2000s when they turned to pseudonephrine pills. Pseudofed, pseudonephrine. That was the precursor for meth, and it was in a little pill form this time. So criminals started buying cold pills in mass quantities, and these uh, pseudonephrine pills made making meth really, really easy. Once you had your pseudonephrine, all you needed was a little red phosphorus and a little iodine. Some people used lye, some people used hydriotic acid, but really all you needed to do was heat the mixture up and it withdrew the inert substances out of the pseudofed pill and what you were left with was methamphetamine. So it was basically the perfect precursor. It was almost little packaged meth pills. Mixing the liquids, heating it up, evaporating it out was very easy to do. The problem was in the volume. 
you had to have a lot of these little pills. So in the early 2000s, these things were flying off the shelves. And not because people had colds, it's because they were making meth. So in response, what the government did was they regulated Sudafed and pseudonephrine pills and required pharmacies and places like that to put them behind the counter. They also started limiting how many boxes you could purchase. Now, criminals, not to be outdone, they started amassing teams and they called these people Smurfs and they would go in en masse and they would all buy a box of Sudafed so that they could have 20 boxes at once even though it was for each individual person. From there, they would just take the team of Smurfs to the next place and then to the next place. And at each establishment, each person was only buying one box, but collectively they were amassing again a large amount of pseudonephrine pills. So then the government enacts a statewide database. So if an individual buys at store A and then they go over to buy at store B, store B will know about it due to the statewide database. And essentially the government put the end to the smurfing enterprise. And it was at this point that the meth industry kind of split. The high-end guys were basically sick of dealing with all the problems and they just started buying their meth direct from Mexico. It was fairly cheap, it was fairly high quality, and there was a constant source of supply. Now the little guys, they went to making meth in their kitchens and their bathtubs and we saw the shake and bake method with the mobile meth labs that people had in the backs of their cars. Now I'm from Missouri and of course Missouri for uh, quite a while was known as the meth capital of the world because of a lot of these mobile meth labs and people trying to make meth in their homes. Now law enforcement in Missouri has put forth substantial effort to try to get rid of these meth labs and to bring these people to justice. And in the last few years, uh, the numbers for Missouri have gone down such that we are no longer the king of meth and uh, meth crime in the United States. But what these shake and bake meth people were doing, and this is really a pretty awful mix of chemicals, uh, they were getting muriatic acid, which you can get at a hardware store. Uh, it's used for cleaning off concrete and brick. They were mixing that with lye. And if they couldn't get lye, they would just use Drano. And they would mix that with ethyl ether, which sounds like that would be hard to get. However, if you buy a can of starter fluid from the automobile store and you spray it and mix it with water, you shake it up, it separates it down into its component parts, one of which is ethyl ether, and you just draw it off. You have your three combinations that you need to make shake and bake meth. Now the reason they call it the shake and bake method is because to make methamphetamine you have to heat it. Uh, you have to heat the different uh, elements to different levels and then mix them in exact combinations. So by no means am I explaining how to make methamphetamine. You can't make methamphetamine from what information I'm giving you in this video. But in the shake and bake method you're making it all in one pot or sometimes one two liter bottle and they don't have the ability to heat that. So they have to create the bake. They have to create the cook. And you do that by mixing certain chemicals together. If you've ever mixed bleach with ammonia, you know the chemical reaction in the bottle makes it very, very hot. This is something that uh, it's frowned upon because the fumes that come off are toxic and they are very flammable. So in this shake and bake meth, they mix the chemicals together and they get really hot in the container. And of course the fumes are toxic, the fumes are flammable, and a lot of times these people are messed up and they're in a barn or the back road or the bathtub and they're making this stuff and they can't resist the temptation to light up a cigarette. Well, when they do, boom, that's when we have these meth lab explosions because of the flammable nature of the fumes that are being generated uh, in this shake and bake or this one pot method of making methamphetamine. So the shake and bake method went on for a while. It has seemed to die out these days. And right now in the United States, at least in my part of the country, the bulk of the methamphetamine is coming in from Mexico. Uh, there aren't a lot of people that are trying to manufacture their own in Missouri because it is so cheap and of such high quality getting it from the Mexican cartel. And there are two main cartels in Mexico that are supplying meth 
to the United States at this time. The Jalisco cartel is known for their meth all around the world. That's kind of what they do the best. And so they are a supplier of methamphetamine in the United States. The biggest supplier of methamphetamine is the Sinaloa cartel. That is the cartel that basically butts up against the southern border of the uh, United States. And while methamphetamine isn't their specialty, uh, they uh, are quite comfortable dealing it and smuggling it into the United States. Now, you probably have heard of that uh, cartel, or at least of its former leader, El Chapo. Now, he's now sitting in an American prison. Uh, however, his son has taken over, and apparently uh, the enterprise is continuing. As an attorney, most of the cases that I see has um, meth coming in from either Texas or Arizona or California, and Phoenix in particular. About every other case uh, that I have dealing with a defendant uh, that is uh, distributing methamphetamine, the supply is coming in to Missouri from Phoenix. Why? I couldn't tell you but I assume it has something to do with the connections there and the Mexican drug cartel. Now, no discussion about methamphetamine in the United States would be complete without a discussion about how art imitates life or the television show Breaking Bad. If you are not familiar with the show, the lead character's name is Walter White. He is a high school chemistry teacher who is diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. Uh, he's got a kid at home and a wife at home and a baby on the way, uh, but he has basically no savings and no ability to provide for his family going forward. So uh, Mr. White breaks bad, as the saying goes, and he teams up with a former student to start putting his chemistry skills uh, to use as a methamphetamine cook. Now, the antagonist in the story is a DEA agent who also just happens to be his brother-in-law. So chaos ensues, and the story is, of course, fiction. However, the chemistry in the story is pretty sound. And the interesting thing in the development of the plot is when they begin, uh, they start making meth with pseudonephrine pills. But like real life, they realize they can't get enough of these pills to have any significant quantity of production. So they change their precursor and they start making meth with phenylacetone. And if you remember, that's the P2P. That is the original meth from the 60s in the biker gangs of California. Hank, who is the FBI agent in the show, even refers to it as biker meth. And while I don't do meth, I don't cook meth, and I can't tell you about what the current Mexican cartel is using to fabricate their meth, there is a general consensus in the community that they too have come full circle and are back to creating and synthesizing meth with the P2P ingredient. So interesting enough, it looks as though the methamphetamine community has gone full circle. So in closing, I was asked the question, is the war against meth ongoing? And of course the answer is yes. I see and work with law enforcement that um, are surveilling and arresting methamphetamine users in Southwest Missouri. And they are doing a very good job at catching those people that are involved. I always tell people that you will get caught. It may not be for a year, it may not be for two years, but eventually you will get caught and you will get sent to prison if you peddle methamphetamine. And if you do it at any significant level, you're gonna wind up in federal court and the issue is going to be essentially how many decades you're gonna serve in the Bureau of Prisons. I also get the other question about will law enforcement ever win the war against methamphetamine? And unfortunately, my answer to that question is probably not. And here's why. Right now, you can get methamphetamine by the pound in on the border of Mexico for about $10,000 a pound. It's actually a little bit less than that. You can drive it to Missouri, where the going rate in Missouri is about $15,000 a pound. So that is an easy five grand for basically a two or three day trip. If you're willing to break it down, uh, you can make even more money. And the appetite in Southwest Missouri is for about 10 pounds of meth every month. So if you buy 10 
pounds of methamphetamine for about $100,000, and you bring it up here and you can sell it for $150,000, there is always going to be somebody out there that's willing to take that risk. Even if they know it's illegal, even if they know they're gonna get caught, somebody somewhere is gonna be willing to take the risk. And I don't mean to glamorize this in any way, shape, or form, because those people all wind up going to prison. So if you're thinking about doing that to make a little extra money, don't, because you'll go to prison. Finally, in conclusion, somebody said, hey, how come you know so much about meth? And it's from reading police reports for the past 20 years about people who have been caught with meth, caught using meth, caught selling meth. I've read police report after police report after police report. And there's a lot of information in those reports. And as I've told you before, no matter what you do or how long you do it, at the end of the day, law enforcement's gonna win. You're gonna wind up in prison. So don't do meth. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked what you heard, hit that like button. If you want to hear more, subscribe. If you got friends that would uh, value this information, share me on social media. And remember the giveaway. Comment giveaway in any of the video's comments and you're automatically registered to win a $50 Amazon gift card. Thanks for watching. You've been watching A Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. Dad, get me out of this.